Hello, hello. So some early mentions here. Uh, um, there are some potentially interactive elements. So if people want to have a terminal up and ready to tinker, you're um, certainly encouraged to do that. I'll mention it again later, but for people who want to have a moment to set things up, that's fine. I am known for my example heavy talk and today is no exception. Um, uh, in the minute before we get started, I also want to mention that uh, I added a birds of a feather for Mojalicious and um, very excited about doing it. Uh, and this will be sort of right afterwards here um, because we have a lot to talk about with, uh, maybe you haven't heard, we've got this mojo.js, we're doing the port of Mojalicious to JavaScript. So if people want to talk about that, talk about regular Mojo, we're going to do a boff basically right after this. Um, I unfortunately am not going to be here tomorrow for sure. And I might be able to get on, on Thursday, but might not, I don't really know. Um, this conference kind of lined up with the only time we could do a, a family vacation. So um, yeah, uh, I guess we're up to time. Just reach out more Joel with this thing. Yeah, yep, that's exactly right. So I'll go for it. Um, <laughs> um, because there is going to be some interaction, I'm going to try to keep my eye on the chat, but it, you know, you know how this goes. Um, I did give this talk once already to um, some coworkers. The talk went spectacularly longer than I had planned, so I cut a bunch of stuff. Um, and Hopefully I'll finish in time, but you know, it's a lot of examples, so we can always just sort of truncate and move on. Um, anyway, I guess I'm gonna get started. Uh, so hi, I'm Joel Berger. Uh, I am a member of the Mojalicious core team, but we're not really gonna talk about Mojo at all today. Um, uh, in fact, we're not really gonna do any Perl today. There's one tiny little Perl script you're gonna see, but that's not the point. Um, someone else can't hear a thing. Did you join with your audio? Um, you wouldn't hear me saying it. <laughs> All right, uh, let you guys help that person out. Um, anyway, there isn't actually a whole lot of code involved in this. This is lower level than code, which is kind of fun. And uh, if you want to follow along, and I encourage you to do so, um, the presentation that I am uh, using right now is sourced at uh, jberger.github.io slash text-based protocols. It's literally what I'm showing you right now. And the materials are at the related GitHub. Uh, there are um, some, some files you may find handy uh, if you are interested uh, in coming back and looking at things later. So I'm at the talk. So we use really high level abstractions. Um, both as users and as developers. Uh, we're really used to them. We're really good at sort of ignoring what the lower level uh, layers of these things are because there's plenty to be done at the high level. Some of these examples, chat clients uh, are a great example. Uh, chat clients are GUIs. They, they have all kinds of uh, high level nicety of, you know, if you're using IRC, it's, it's pretty Spartan, but you know, Slack or things have uh, editing features and GIFs and all that other stuff. And they, they, they show it to you in a nice pretty GUI, but there's a protocol behind there, especially for IRC. I think Slack has one too. I'm not sure how exposed it is. Uh, browsers, browsers hide you the HTML and the HTTP. So the transport and the content are both hidden um, more or less in the browser. Caching layers are a really interesting uh, example because caching layers are often abstracted at the web framework level, at a cache abstraction library level. So in, in um, Perl, we have, uh, I think, several. There are cache any. There's also, um, oh, what was the name of that thing? Uh, there, there's a cache abstraction that I suddenly blanked on the name. Um, and, uh, and then there are even cache engine language bindings. So like there's a memcache binding for Perl, and there's a Redis binding for Perl, and things like that. So you've got 
often several layers of abstraction between you and caching library or caching layers. But most caches actually uh, have a low level protocol too. And many of these, as I sort of alluded to there a second ago, many of these protocols are actually human readable ish um, for some values of human readable. And they use simple transmission mechanisms like TCP. They might also use UDP and things, but today we're going to focus on TCP. And for many of these, it is useful to know how these abstractions work by looking at their lower level protocols. It can help you understand how the abstractions are working or why they are working the way they are, why things are structured the way they are when you know how the protocols themselves work. I skimmed over a thing just there. TCP, what is TCP? Well, TCP is the transmission control protocol. And what people will probably recognize uh, if you've heard of that at all, it's really the backbone of all of our network communications. We use it all the time, basically. With some exceptions for UDP, it really runs just about everything we do over the internet. Um, a nice thing about TCP is the messages that you send over TCP are ordered, meaning if you send A and then send B, A will arrive before B arrives. Um, the messages are reliable, meaning uh, that they will be sent and they will be received. Uh, and if they are not received, um, there is error checking and the error checking will either try to retry it or if it can't retry, you know, once it gets through enough layers of its, of its own abstraction, it will throw an error and close the connection. So you, you can be sure that messages are getting through if you don't get an error. And TCP is bi-directional. In a console, you're used to things being almost sort of tri-directional where you have an input, but you have multiple output streams. These are just bi-directional. You send content, you receive content. Importantly, TCP is streams, it is not framed. So all you can do is send bytes and receive bytes. And uh, when you send those bytes, when, you, when you're reading bytes, I'm sorry, those messages may or may not be complete. There might still be more coming. You know that it's ordered and you know that it's reliable, but you may not know for sure that you have received everything for a particular message that you're curious about. And we'll see how that gets dealt with. That's, that becomes a major point of what is going to be discussed in this talk. Um, one thing to note, WebSocket, even though it's got the name Socket and Socket is sort of related concept to this, WebSockets are framed. So if you're ever you know, writing a protocol over WebSockets, you actually send messages and the WebSocket itself will assure you that the entire message that was sent is received and the, the message is emitted at that same time. That's not important for the rest of the talk, but I just want to put that there because, you know, for example, Modulicious will care quite a bit. Um, so how do we know when the message is complete? Well, there are several mechanisms by which you can know that. You could define your protocol, and it's, it's up to the protocol to define when the messages are complete. Uh, your protocol might define that a message is complete when the connection is closed. You could just say, I'm sending you bytes until I'm done, and then I'm closing the connection. The problem with that is that it's expensive. Making these TCP uh, streams is not cheap from a resource level. Um, and doing that too much would really slow you down. So while you can do that in practice, not many um, protocols do anymore. Uh, you might know that the message is complete because you reach a known boundary, usually a new line. So there are things called line-based protocols and at a new line. And uh, you know whatever kind of message you send might um, have any sort of payload it might want, except can't have a new line in it because that new line symbolizes it's the end of a message. Well, okay, so how do I send a message with a new line in it? And that's when you start getting into some complexity there. There's another way to do it is to say, I'm going to send you X number of bytes. And then the client knows then to receive that number of bytes. And you have to figure out how do I know how, how many bytes I'm going to send. That has to be part of the protocol. And because of that, you sometimes get a combination of these um, where you have some amount of a, a new line based um, start and then a, a boundary, a, a, a number of bytes based um, body, 
and you'll see some of those things come up. And if these start sounding familiar, it's, it's because they are. A quick note about new lines. So now we're really into the weeds. Some protocols require a slash n, otherwise called a line feed. Others require the slash r slash n, a carriage return line feed. The historical reasons for this are not interesting, or maybe they are, but they're beyond the scope of this. Um, what is important to know is that some protocols or servers or clients or whatever are more tolerant of the wrong ending than others. So it's important that you at least know which ones care and which ones are gonna really complain that you did it wrong. If you do have to send a literal carriage return slash R, you can check how to send it in your terminal by running uh, STTY space dash A. Um, I'm assuming in a Unixy world, if you're in Windows, I really don't know how to help you. Uh, in fact, you probably do send RNs, uh, carriage return line feeds already. I, who knows, I'm not even gonna speculate. Uh, when you run that command, if you look for the L next value, uh, it will tell you how to send a carriage, uh, yeah, carriage return. <laughs> <laughs> Paul's, Paul's trolling me over there. Um, <laughs> um, it is, uh, it's a control V for me, and I meant to add a, a line here, but oftentimes once you hit control V, you have to hit enter, and the thing you will see in your console is a control M. I don't quite understand that. I'm sure someone here knows why it shows it like that, but hopefully you don't have to deal with that too much. I'm gonna show you other ways to deal with this when possible. So, all right, we've talked a lot about some of the theory here. How are we gonna actually start getting our feet wet and playing with these things? Well, we need a TCP client. You've probably all heard of Telnet. Um, Telnet is the venerable TCP client. Um, it is kind of meant to do a few other things that aren't just this. And because of that, it can be a bit of a nuisance. Um, in fact, I would argue it is harder to exit Telnet than it is to exit Vim, and I'm a Vim user, so I can say that. Um, uh, it's not even always installed anymore. A lot of people used to have the argument, well, at least Telnet's here. Well, it's not even always true anymore. Um, so uh, one nice thing about Telnet, though, is it will always send a carriage return line feed. Um, you probably can configure that somehow, but the default is to send a carriage return line feed. You would invoke it by telnet space, your the host you want to talk to space, and then the port that you want to talk to. Please call from upper left down to lower left down. <laughs> uh, okay, fine. Fair point. Those are backslashes. <laughs> um, I'm probably going to say RN in practice going forward. Um, or carriage return line feed because same the whole thing as said is long. Anyway, moving on. Netcat. So um, I would encourage you to use Netcat when you can. It's much easier. Um, it's a simple client. Uh, it just defaults. It, it just attaches to standard in and standard out, uh, which makes it really useful for pipes. So you can do it as an interactive um, uh, version of that too. Uh, some versions allow. Uh, dash little c or dash big c to send the carriage return line feed. Um, and I would recommend that you uh, look at the man page for your netcat implementation and see which is possible and uh, use that because it will save you a lot of headache. Um, also important to note, because I'm gonna show you here an example, echo will end uh, what you echo with a line feed with a backslash n, and uh, you can tell it not to by passing a dash n there. It's, it's a whole thing, but um, assuming you're gonna do it like this, you probably want to use uh, netcat fix up that um, line ending for you. Uh, here's a particular example. This is uh, memcached and we're gonna see some memcached stuff later, but this would let you send a command and get the output uh, without ever really sort of seeing what's being done because you're piping both directions. Another handy client is SoCat, um, which is like NetCat, but has more features. Um, this is especially useful if you want to do uh, SSL. 
because Netcat can't do SSL that I'm aware of, um, but SoCat can. And uh, the way you do options um, for SoCat are you attach them to the, the parameter directions um, and you join those with commas. So um, uh, the example I'm showing here at the bottom is SoCat dash. Uh, so um, from standard input, and then talk to uh, OpenSSL uh, DuckDuckGo.com colon four four three. So this is going to open an SSL uh, TCP socket to to DuckDuckGo. And um, if you needed to do that same sort of dash C behavior, you want to automatically fix up one carriage return line feeds. You could do dash comma CRLF, um, and I actually will have an example of that later. Um, you can also turn off SSL verification if you need it for some reason. Um, my wife would like you to know that SoCat is tacos backwards, and I would like you to know that my wife is awesome. Uh, some other clients you can use. Um, OpenSSL's S client, um, it lets uh, you talk um, SSL, um, you know, it's a full TCP client, I've actually never really used it for that. I use that for testing that SSL connections are working, you know, why am I getting an SSL error or whatever. But once you've seen all your SSL connection details, what you're left with is a TCP client. So you can use that if you want. Uh, most languages have TCP clients both built into the, the, the language or easily installable. Um, and of course, here at the Perl conference, I'm going to say Mojo IO loop client is um, is an, uh, a thing that you can use and, and get a nice event-based um, interaction with TCP. All right, so uh, let's see. I've got plenty of time. I'm, I'm doing good here. So we have some examples we're going to look at today. We're going to play with uh, Graphite, which is a metrics engine, uh, IRC, the chat client and memcache, which is a caching layer, and then HTTP. For IRC, uh, I especially would love it if some people wanted to play along with me and, and generate some traffic so that people can see what comes through. Um, I can do it myself, but it's more fun if people get involved. And uh, I had to cut Redis for time. That was the big cut that I did. And I feel bad about it because I was really excited about it. But, um, I encourage you to come back later and play with Redis. It's a really cool protocol. And, um, and it's, it's a little deeper protocol, but it's definitely understandable. And I like it a lot. For playing around during the conference, um, I have all of those services, except for Redis, live on my jburger.pl server. Um, and after the conference, uh, if you'd like to, you can use Docker. I have a Docker Compose file in the uh, materials for this talk. Uh, and you can see that Graphite runs on port 8080 on my server um, because opening a port that's, um, that's less than 1024, you need privileges. Uh, I have an IRC server that is running non-SSL on 6667 and SSL on 6697. Uh, a memcached on port 11211 and an HTTP echo server. So it's, it's an HTTP server whose job it is to echo back the things from the request. Um, and that's running on port 8081. I, as I said, I don't have my Redis running right now, um, but if you wanted to do Docker Compose up, then you can uh, do that too. So the purpose of these examples is to show you different types of protocols, get you comfortable with using the tools and the methods, and to give you examples, not the details. I am going to skim the heck out of every one of these things. Um, I'll give you just the minimum you need to play around, and then I encourage you to uh, explore further. I think I've linked to every one of the protocol um, RFCs uh, or whatever documentation they have. Um, so if you're clicking along with me, you'll have that uh, at your fingertips. And I do try to build up the, the concepts here a little bit. So on to our first example, finally, um, Graphite. Graphite, as I said, is a high-performance metrics collector. So you want to store certain data, um, time series data. 
And it takes in its metrics via a simple TCP line protocol, meaning it, it watches for the end of messages at, at, uh, at line endings. It doesn't give you any responses. Um, part of the reason I'm starting with graphite, it is sort of unidirectional. Um, the purpose of graphite is to take in metrics as absolutely fast as it can. And it's very good at that. And one of the reasons is it doesn't actually um, give you any feedback when it's doing it. Uh, the visualizations come from a web service and we're gonna see that on port 8080. And again, it uses um, line, line, oh, it uses line feed, not carriage return line feed, line endings. So the graphite plain text format, you give the dot separated uh, metric name. You give a value, I think it has to be a floating point value and it could be an image or two, but I think it has to be numeric. And then the current timestamp and then a backslash n. Uh, so you could imagine that we would want to send some value like this, um, where I could say I have a bunch of weather data and then under weather data, I have temperature data. And then under temperature, I have Chicago. And I'm going to store that it is 78.2. And yes, 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 fine. Celsius, whatever. Uh, generating that date is a little bit annoying, but there's this fun thing you can do, which is use date on your um, command line to build the message. And we can do just that. Okay. Now, watch this. You should see that I have weather temp Chicago. And so I'm trying to fit this into a version where you can actually see anything. So we're right now we're viewing the last 24 hours. What we really care about is maybe the last four minutes. And there you see some data. Now we can imagine that maybe the temperature has gone up around here. It's now a balmy 82 degrees. And we refresh. And you can see that the line is actually up here at the top. So maybe I should do even one more. And you can see even more data coming along here. Use, oh, yep. Uh, I will defend, I will defend Fahrenheit in that it is metric on the range we care about. How often are you caring about, you know, boiling water temperature? Sometimes, rarely. <laughs> Other than that, yes, absolutely, use SI. Um, and yes, I'm trolling just a little bit. We can even, let me do one more thing here. <laughs> you do care when you're boiling water. How often are you boiling water? I care more about what temperature it is. Local host, 203. And uh, one other nice thing about the, um, the uh, plain text format here is I can actually send temp. Chicago, it is now 95 in New Celsius, people are scorching. And I'm gonna send minus one, which says use the server time when it arrives. And that can be handy if I'm dealing with places where it's not easy to get the time. So it's a point that's up here. Kelvin, absolutely, we should all work in Kelvin. Anyway, that's, that's uh, graphite, very simple and very useful, but it's an easy dip your toe into, um, into TCP. Which brings us to sending and receiving data. And I'm gonna use my example IRC. So what is IRC? Well, IRC is the venerable chat protocol, um, the chat protocol that we get all the others. It is mostly human readable. There are a few things that are not as human readable. Um, it is a bi-directional line protocol as well. Uh, it is not request response. There are some uh, commands that will look 
sort of request response but it's not really. Um, you send messages to the server and then the server may send messages that are things you might care about, but those are not necessarily related. So you might say, I would like some permissions and then it might tell you back, oh, you have some permissions, but that is not technically a request response. Um, and typically the server only sends you messages that you need. This is important for something like a multi-room chat protocol where there are probably chat messages of many, many, many rooms going all at the same time. Um, shuffling up the chat, I should turn the chat off. Um, so it will send you the messages that you need. So rooms you're subscribed to or, or um, user updates and rooms that you care about. Uh, technically it wants a carriage return line feed, but in practice, most servers return, uh, will accept simple line feeds. The message format is pretty simple. Um, there's an optional prefix, which the clients don't use by default and the servers should use by default, maybe even must, um, which has something to do with which particular server you're talking to. Uh, then you have space separated arguments, um, up to 15 arguments um, on a single command. I don't know of any that have that, there probably are. Uh, you can have a max message length of 512 bytes, including the ending. Um, the, having new lines in those arguments is prohibited. And the spaces in the arguments are prohibited, except when you're using the trailing argument and you put in a special leading colon. So you'll see what that looks like here. Um, to play around with it, IRC can be kind of noisy and especially it gets annoying when you're trying to type something in and another message is coming out at you. So what I'm gonna recommend is you redirect your output to a file and then tail the file. And that's how you're gonna see the output without it interrupting you. Probably smarter ways of doing that, but this is an easy way to do it. Um, then you connect to the server on port 6667 or 6697, sorry. Um, uh, if you're doing SSL version. And the first thing you have to do is tell it your nick and your username. Now, on most servers, your nickname and your username are the same. Uh, nick takes no other arguments but your nickname. User takes several arguments. Uh, your username, uh, almost always the value zero, apparently the value eight can make you hidden, I think. I'm not entirely sure about that. This star is literally unused. Uh, just put star and then colon real name. And you can see that this is where um, for the trailing argument, your real name value can contain the space because you put this colon here. Um, and before we play along, around with this, I wanna say one more thing. Um, we'll get back to some other stuff later, but uh, if the server sends you a ping with some text, you need to somewhat promptly reply pong with that text or it will drop your connection. When I played with this with my work colleagues uh, last week, forgot to mention that until sort of the end and they were all like, hey, why isn't this working? Yeah, fine. You should probably know that first. So I have four terminals here and I hope you can see them all well enough. I am going to make a connection to localhost. So I'm doing localhost. This is, I'm already on jburger.pl. If people would like to connect uh, jburger.pl rather than localhost and port 6667. I'm going to say nick jburger user jburger zero star colon burger. This is, by the way, just my server and I'm going to blow it away in an hour anyway. So um, don't worry about it. And you can see you get a whole bunch. Um, <laughs> You can get a whole bunch of output, and this is sort of the uh, login message and a bunch of other stuff that happens. Um, and now we have to do something with it. So to join a chat room is fairly simple. It's join, and we're gonna join test. So join test. And you'll notice in your output, you can see that uh, I have joined test and 
it tells me that I'm on test and it tells everyone else, or it tells me everyone who's on test. Uh, and as I say, say here, the response you get shows you the join that happened and you and everyone else in the channel will get that message. And to show you that, if and until someone else joins in, uh, here I'm gonna join over SSL, so you can have a more interesting example there. And here's Nick, we're gonna do Nick of Superman, user Superman, zero star, work, Kent. And you've seen Tux join in, cool. Join, and I can type test. Now, the nice thing is we can now see, well, this particular server apparently doesn't give me all the names. I thought, oh no, here it does. Jayburger and Tux are already on there. And you'll notice, I was assuming I was getting pretty close here. I just got a ping for Jayburger, so I got a on jburger on just with the same content that we send now you've already seen tux send a message but um the command for sending a message is priv message you are able to send a message to a client to, a, to another um client directly or to an entire channel with the prefix pound here and then you send your message with a colon so i can send And you'll notice that my second client saw the message. The first one didn't. And that's interesting because again, the client, the, the server only sends messages that it thinks you're interested in. And since you sent the message, it assumes you don't need to know that it sent the message, but everyone else will see it. Uh, server does not allow me to make something. <laughs> Yes, sorry, Tux. I, uh, I this is just the stock setup of, of a particular IRC server, so um, I did not customize it at all. It probably can do something better. Um, Kong Superman. I have now refreshed that. There's another pin here. So you can see that this is possible, but um, I, I expect, by the way, Tux, that it that it. Uh, can because this is like a really new project for doing IRC stuff, but it's got all configuration. I just I never got there. Um, you can see that you don't probably want to do this by hand to do all your regular communication, um, but it's handy to see how the protocol works and which messages get sent, and it's good for debugging if you were writing an IRC client, and it can give you some idea of how these particular um, types of behaviors work in you know, a complex line protocol. You can see another person has joined, which is a little bit too bad because I am just about to switch away from these. So you guys can continue to have fun over there. My third example is requests and responses. Um, and I'm gonna use the memcached protocol so what is memcached? Memcached is an in-memory cache. Um, so it's fast and it's, it's, um, it's uh, what's the word, um, volatile. It, it, it doesn't promise you that it's gonna store anything really, um, but you can use it to cache uh, um, credentials lookups, not credentials lookups, uh, user objects and things so that you don't have to always be going back to a database for example. Uh, there are some simple commands for set and get. Um, there are plenty of other commands that you can use if you want, but I'm only gonna do those. And in reply to each command you send, you will get one reply in return. So this is a, a proper request response protocol. Uh, in the line protocol, there is some length prefixed content and some line content, and you'll see that. Um, memcached, unlike the other ones that I've shown you so far, is very particular about wanting cares return line feed. So we have to be sure we do that right. right. 
So the first step, we want to store something in the storage. Get um, other window. So the set command takes the key name, uh, some flags, which I'm mostly going to skim over, but it's you can use it uh, however you want. It's application um, defined. Um, people usually use them as uh, bit flag vectors. And uh, an expiration time. And uh, there we go. The expiration time can be zero to mean that the, the uh, storage will never expire by time. Again, it's a volatile storage, so it's not promising you that it's storing anything, but it's not going to automatically expire by time. Uh, or you can set a Unix timestamp, or you can tell it expire in a number of seconds from now. There's some, some value of timestamp there where it assumes greater than that is a Unix timestamp and less than that's so seconds from now. I don't know what that number is. I meant to look that up and I forgot to do so. Um, and then uh, you have to tell it the length of the message you're about to send in bytes. And the message is going to end with a carriage return line feed, but you should not include that in your payload. So one thing we're going to do is we're going to say, uh, we're going to echo and we're going to do dash n because we do not want, this is too hard to see what it is. Uh, echo dash n, we're going to send foo bar as a JSON object. But right now I care about how long is that in bytes? And WC-C tells me that that is 13. So now I'm going to hit C, localhost 11211. And I'm going to send set foo. I don't care about flags. I don't care about expiring. And I'm going to send you 13 bytes. So step two, I have to send the payload. And it has to be the correct length. So I'm going to send, in this case, foo bar. And when I've done it correctly, it should reply to me that that value has been stored. Uh, example here, I said hello world. And it doesn't matter what you send, as long as it's the right length. If successful, you'll see stored. And otherwise, you might get one of several errors. And these errors are particular to the um, these errors are not particular to the set command, but the set command doesn't have any other errors. Um, other commands might. Um, I did it successfully here. If you if you if you give it the wrong length and then give it, you know, a payload that doesn't match that length, it will give you client error, for example. Um, but it's a very simple request response protocol. So if you were writing a client to this, you would just look for. The fact that you got stored and that would tell you it was successful. Now, getting your keys back out. The command is simply get, and you can get one key, and it will give you values from that key. Or you can get multiple keys, and it will give you all those responses back. But again, in a single message, you'll see how that's formatted here. It, uh, the value, um, the response comes back with the literal keyword value the key you sent, any flags that were originally set, and again, we ignored that by just setting zero, and the length of the body to be expected. It then sends you this, you know, or whatever you know, your payload was, and it will give you that message for every key you request, and then finally, the keyword end. So here we can do get foo, and it gives us value foo 013 and the payload. And actually, I can get foo foo, and it will give me the value twice. And you can see what that message looks like. Now, this can be really handy when you're having trouble um, with with uh, session caching or something, and, and you want to just say like, "Look, what's going on in memcached? I want to just go in and talk to it." But also, it can mean that if you're using a language that doesn't have uh, bindings to memcached already, you can just write one. It's really not that hard. Finally, the big one, 
HTTP, we've done simple request responses. HTTP is a complex protocol. Um, it's both its parsing and behavior depend on lots of different factors. Uh, technically, the spec says it's carriage return line feeds, but most servers will also accept uh, just simple line feeds. Note, this is not HTML. The content that we send in the body can be anything, or in fact, we could send nothing. Um, the fact that it's hypertext transfer protocol sort of implies that it's hypertext markup language, but it's not. It can send anything you want. The HTT message comes in three sections. There's a start line, then there are headers, and then optionally there's a body. Technically, depending on a few things, headers are also optional, but that's, that's already getting pretty gray. So the start line is the method, path, and then HTTP slash version. So uh, typically HTTP 1.1. At a command line, you actually might hack this a little bit because HTTP 1.0 is that example that I said before of a protocol wherein on finishing the message, it would close the connection. So if you just wanna cheat here, and send git slash HTTP 1.0, uh, it will just send you the reply and then close the connection, which can be handy. Uh, that's the start line for a request. For a response, the server will reply back to you, HTTP slash version, the version you chose, and you must reply with the version you chose if it's gonna give you anything. Uh, the status code, and then the message that, that corresponds to that status code. This is not the body of the message, this is just 200 okay, 404 not found, um, things like that. So the, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the status and the message. Before I show you an example of this, I really should show you some HTTP headers or at least what the HTTP headers are like because it turns out that, um, well, I think I mentioned this in a minute, so I'm gonna say where the headers are key value pairs, where the keys and the values are colon separated. I think colon space is fine too. Um, the pairs, each pair ends with a carriage return line feed. The keys are case insensitive. And depending on which header you're talking about, the value may be very, very complex. In fact, there are whole RFCs that talk about um, how to parse particular uh, HTTP headers. But in the end, they end with a carriage return line feed. And so for our purposes, it's still re reasonably easy to deal with. And then the headers section ends with an empty line containing only, it should be an, um, carriage return line feed. So there's basically one blank line and that's the end of the HTTP headers. I told you that I had almost no code in this. Um, in the uh, repository, I've included a simple little script. And what it does is, um, select will tell it uh, where to send output. And so we first select standard error, and then we're gonna do loop over the input, print out that input, but then select standard out if you hit that empty line. And this is already where you can say, oh, it was handy to know what the protocol was because I can write a little script that does this. Now, why would I do this? Well, because after headers, we might care about doing something interesting with the body. And the body, uh, things that are going to inspect the body, like maybe JQ. Uh, yeah, you're probably right, Tux. That should probably be slash C. Um, it, well, it works. You're probably right, but it does work. So um, we'll, we'll accept pull requests. The nice thing about this is particularly if you get some JSON data back, you can pipe it to JQ and the headers won't get in the way. Uh, quick note about the request uh, host header. So remember I said that headers are optional or headers are sometimes optional. They were optional in HTTP 1.0 but they are technically required by HTTP 1.1. And that was because they were already seeing that uh, people were doing name-based virtual hosting. So 
you can request the page from an IP address, but that IP address might post more than one uh, website. And so the, the, the application needed a way to say, hey, which website were you actually asking about? And so they have this host header where you put that in. Um, as I mentioned before, the start line only has a path, so you couldn't make an absolute URL out of that. All right, that's enough talk. Let's play around with this. So I told you I have, um, let's do, let's do one purely from the command line first. Let's do echo git uh, slash HTTP 1.0. And I told you with 1.0, it's gonna just close the connection. So we can just cheat this way. We don't even need to do headers um, because we're going to type this to netcat-c local, oh okay, here, I'll just do it even to jburger.pl for your um, ease of following along. 8081, this is the echo server that I told you about before, remember? And we're gonna pipe this to that world. Oh, I'm not in the right directory. Presentations, text based protocols. There we go. Uh, I'm going to do that one. Go all the way into here. You see, I have that head script that I'd mentioned before. So we're going to do echo git slash HTTP 1.0. I pipe this to the cat minus C, jburger.pl colon pd81. Like that to um, that slash head.pl and pipe that to JQ. What's going on here? I did dash C. Why are you yelling at me? Oh, not colon, space. And it didn't kill the connection. That's most frustrating. All right, well, we'll do it the right way then. E1, type, type jq dot, type it by hand, git slash HTTP 1.0. It's making me look bad today. Oh, great. All right. Well, we're just going to play around with it directly. Now. Oh, two lines, because we still have to end the head section, even though. Aha, see? Now right, we're going to go all the way back to here, and we're going to, we're going to insert. That it still didn't. Oh, because because I don't actually need. Ah, uh, yep. All right. Live demos. Why do I even try? We're gonna do this this way. Get slash HTTP one point Enter. Connection close. Why didn't you send me anything? Everything hates me. <laughs> um, right, well, yeah, that's what it should be, but it just wasn't so. One, I'm going to forget the whole head thing, and we're just going to see what it gives me. 1.1, we say host jburger.pl, and we see that we get some output. And the nice thing about the output, <laughs> we see that the output uh, tells us stuff about, for example, we got a host header that said jburger.pl. Um, Echo Alonson's 
Right, I understand that, but I'm piping it to netcat-c, which should translate it. But I'm not sending two of them, which is, I think, the problem, because I have to end the headings, header section. So I'll tell you, tell you what, I'm gonna do it like this. So people are giving me pointers. Is it the double quotes? That's what's gonna give it to me? All right, so this is why I... Add request. Oh, because I need the dash n now. And I don't need the C. <laughs> We're having fun now. Whatever. I don't know. I'm not going to play with that too much, but just head retain the headers. It doesn't drop the headers. It echo needs dash E. All right, I don't know what I did wrong there. You guys are you guys are fixing things for me. So now you can finally see what it should have been. I promise I did this on my, well, I developed this talk on my Mac and I wonder if something I did was slightly different than that. Um, anyway, the nice thing about this echo server is that you can see uh, all the different parameters of the request that you sent, which can be nice when you're sort of investigating these things on yourself. Uh, that dash E tells you to interpret the literal um, slash uh, backslash n. Without that, it sends the literal backslash n. Very good. Okay. Um, after making myself look a little foolish, no, that head command, um, what it does is it sends the headers to standard error um, so that you can then pipe the, the output to uh, standard out through to, in this case, jQuery to do the, a nice um, uh, pretty printing for you. And colorizing things. Uh, now that we've done that, we could do, for example, have a little fun and do so cat dash with to SSL google.com before three and um, you can say get slash HTTP 1.1. And you can do, you can do the host header because that's required in 1.1, google.com. And after you send that, you get your response. Great. Um, I have just a little bit of time left, so I'm barely going to touch on the HTTP message body. But the HTTP message body only uh, is sent on certain directions with certain methods and certain status codes. So you when you do a request with git there is no body usually yes i'm looking at you elastic search um but maybe a reply with a 204 will also have no body um head requests have no body for example too um uh, you know the message is complete in several ways as i mentioned http 1.0 uh will just close the connection you can also request in HTTP 1.1 with a header, you can say connection closed and it will behave that same way for you. Uh, uh, you can, um, if the message has a body, then there will be a content length header, which will tell you the number of bytes um, plus the final character to line feed. Um, all the rules go out the window with chunk transfer encoding, which is another header you can specify at which point you start saying, I'm about to send you n bytes and then read n bytes and it goes like that until you get a zero message. Um, <laughs> we're driving Pip crazy on the chat with being wrong about which one is slash and backslash. That's, maybe I should just start trolling, it'd be funny. Uh, and that's all I've got to say. I've gone only just a couple minutes longer than I meant to. Um, I do encourage you if you had fun with this to look at the Redis protocol, it's a lot of fun. Um, and then the thing that I was going to show off if I had enough time, but there was nearly going to be enough time, there's a pro protocol called guacamole, which is unrelated to um, the guacamole that, that uh, Sawyer proposed last year, which is a VNC uh, abstraction library. And uh, for reasons we don't need to go into, it's separated into two different servers. And I wrote a new client to replace its, one of its two um, systems. Uh, and it's 
a lot of fun to, to dig into protocols at that layer. So if you're interested in that, you can see how I wrote a, a rather complex uh, client to um, guacamole, which I called Blocklight, and that is on uh, CPAN. Um, so in conclusion, go play with text-based protocols. Don't be um, afraid to go dig into just, you, you saw I made a request to Google, no one's gonna kill you over opening a direct TCP socket to Google. It's the same thing your browser does. So have fun, play with things um, and enjoy. Thank you.